people say, I don't look like a mathematician. <laughs> what is a mathematician supposed to look like? Why is there some preconceived idea of what a mathematician should look like? Here's another thing people tell me a lot. They say, I'm terrible at mathematics. Why do people say that they're terrible about mathematics? I think that this all comes from misunderstandings about what mathematics really is. Let me tell you a story. I'm terrible at sport. I really am terrible at sport. <laughs> I was traumatized by school sports lessons, just like other people are traumatized by school maths lessons. I could not wait to leave school and never have to do sport ever again. Just like other people can't wait to leave school and never have to do maths ever again. After I left school, I became fat. <laughs> really fat. And eventually I realized that I should probably do some exercise. <laughs> and then I realized this. I realized that exercise did not have to be like school sports lessons and that it did not have to involve mean teachers telling me what to do. So now I go to the gym. At the gym, I only do exercises I really enjoy. I am terrible at running. I am terrible at throwing. And I'm terrible at catching. So I will always be terrible at any sport involving a ball. But this doesn't have to mean I'm unfit. I'm very fit. I have biceps. I also have a pretty strong core. I'm proud of that, too. Also, I'm intellectually fit. And I'm also proud of that. And for me, the core of intellectual fitness is mathematics not school mathematics. And when people say they're terrible at mathematics, maybe they're just terrible at school maths, just like I was terrible at school sport. So I would like to tell you about a different kind of maths, the kind of maths that can help everybody be more intellectually fit. What does intellectually fit mean? I think being intellectually fit means that you can think quickly and clearly. I think it means that you can defend your arguments without just having to shout more loudly. As it happens, I'm also very good at shouting loudly. <laughs> I think being intellectually fit means that you're strong enough to solve really big problems. And I think it also means, importantly, flexibility, so that you can see things from other points of view and also create original ideas. And all of this, I think, is good for everybody. So why do people say they're terrible at maths? Does anyone want to be intellectually flabby? I think this comes from partly fear. People are traumatized by their school maths lessons. I think it also comes from misunderstanding of what maths really is. So here are some things that mathematics is not. Mathematics is not multiplying large numbers in your head. It is not reciting hundreds of digits of pi. I can recite two digits of pi. Mathematics is not calculating a tip on a restaurant bill. Mathematics is not numbers, it's not equations, it's not even calculus or something like that. So what is it? I think mathematics is the study of how things work. Now, it's not the study of how any old things work, I think it's the study of how logical things work. And it's not any old study of how logical things work, it's the logical study of how logical things work. Now, the trouble with that is that nothing actually behaves logically. I don't behave logically. You don't behave logically. You don't behave logically. You don't behave logically. My computer definitely doesn't behave logically. <laughs> so to, to study anything logically, we have to forget about the pesky details that stop things behaving logically, and I love forgetting details. And that takes us away from the real world and into the abstract world of ideas where everything does behave according to pure and beautiful logic. For example, if you give me two cookies and then you give me another two cookies, how many cookies will I have? 
I will have zero cookies because I will eat them all. Cookies do not behave according to logic, unless you impose the demand that I'm not allowed to eat the cookies. In which case, what's the point of them being cookies? They might as well just be blobs. And that's what abstraction is. It's turning cookies into blobs, at which point you might say, that doesn't sound fun. And some people think that mathematics takes all the fun out of everything. So why do I love it so much? Because I do. The reason I love mathematics so much is basically because I never stopped being that two-year-old who keeps asking the question, why? 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 Two-year-olds are so curious, and they always know that whatever you answer, you can, they can always ask why again. Also, they love annoying the adults. The trouble is that education stifles this curiosity. It asks children to accept things as being true just because somebody told them, because their teacher told them, because a book told them, because their lesson told them, maybe because the internet told them. I was never satisfied with any of those answers unless they were backed up by logic, and that took me into the world of mathematics, this beautiful world where things aren't true because of feelings or gut instinct or experience or superiority or even evidence, and certainly not loudness or violence and aggression, just because of logic, and I love that. The other reason I love this world is that everything in it is free. Ideas are free. As soon as you have an idea for something that you want to play with in the mathematical world, it's yours. Ping! You don't have to go bugging someone to buy you that spaceship Lego set. Please, please. Once you've thought of it, you can have it. I wish my dinner would appear like that once I'd thought of it. That's very different from school math. School math is taught as a bunch of rules that you have to follow. Mathematicians actually really hate following rules, especially other people's rules. Mathematicians are really a bunch of rebels. The only rules they want to follow are logic, and apart from that, they make everything up. <laughs> math is about creating worlds and seeing what happens in them. The thing is, it's hard to show people what it looks like to do that inside those worlds. Here's what I look like when I'm doing maths. or occasionally, ah! I think there are ways to show glimpses into that world, though. I just think that showing everyone the rules is entirely the wrong way of doing it. Just like when we're tempted to go on holiday, we're tempted by pictures of beaches and castles and mountains, not by pictures of passport control. <laughs> I would like to show you a little glimpse inside this world, and I like to do it by showing unexpected connections between things. Because that's the point of abstraction. When you forget about the details, when you forget about, say, the wallpaper and these beautiful ornaments and the chandeliers and the paint, the structure of a building looks more like the structure of another building than it did with all that paint on top. Just like, say, if we took all our clothes off, we'd all look a lot more similar than we do with our clothes on. And if, since it's Halloween, we stripped all our flesh off and became skeletons, then we'd really look similar. So one of the points of doing this in maths is to show that some things are more similar than they appear to be. And I love making connections between things. I think that's a nicer thing to do than to show how different things are. So I'm going to show you some of my favorite things, including I'm going to play you one of my favorite pieces of Bach. The fugue, just the opening of the fugue in B major from the second book of Preludes and Fugues. Because it's a fugue, it starts with a theme that gets repeated in different voices. Now, I've written out the theme for you. So here's the theme. And then what Bach does, because he's some kind of genius or something, is he turns it upside down. So 
that then gets woven into the texture up here. Now, I think that's pretty cool that you can just turn it upside down. What's... Thank you. What's even more cool is you could play it in a loop, but if I turn the ends over and twist them like that, I've made a Merbius strip. I'm just going to get my tape and stick it together. A Merbius strip is when you take a piece, a strip of paper and you stick the ends together with a twist so that the front meets the back. And it means now that this thing has only one side because the front has met the back. This is a very interesting mathematical object. And it also gives rise to the joke, why did the chicken cross the Merbius strip? <laughs> and now, I can play it in a loop, and because it's only got one side, let's see if we can make this visible. So here we are. I'll have to sing it, because I haven't got enough hands. I ran out of hands, so we go, do, do, do. Let's see. Do, where's a B? Okay, here we go. Do, 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 So this shows a connection between Bach and Merbius strips. I'm not trying to say that everything can be understood using logic. I love the fact that this piece of music has beauty that I cannot possibly explain using logic. I like trying to find parts of it that I can. And for me, actually, the thing that's the most beautiful is the bit just beyond what I can explain. So the more I explain, actually, the more I access the parts I can't explain and find more beauty. I don't think that everything can be explained by logic, which is a good thing. Otherwise, there wouldn't be poetry and music and art and love and human emotions. But mathematics not being the whole world, it's not even, it's not even really part of the real world. It's a dream world. It's a beautiful dream world. And as we've seen from several of the other speakers already today, progress starts with dreams. And so I would like to give you mathematics as a place where progress begins, a dream world where progress can begin. Thank you. <laughs>